Hey, Small Beans listener, did you know we're in the process of trying to make a movie? It's true. It's called Papa Bear and tells the story of the time my dad came out as a gay furry when I was 17. We're currently looking for investors, creative partners, and talent to attach to the project. If you'd like to know more or to see our script, lookbook, and business plan, please hit us up at allthesmallbeans at gmail.com. Small Beans patrons can also listen in on the whole process by checking out our movie production diary series over at the Patreon. Thanks for your time, and now, on with the pod. Hello there, and welcome back to Like Razorblade Pie, a bite-sized book club investigating the short speculative fiction of my favorite writer of all time, Harlan Ellison. Uh, and today we're talking specifically about a piece from the uh, collection Angry Candy, originally. It's called Paladin of the Lost Hour, and as I usually do when we break off a new collection, which we're doing a lot because the podcast is still in early days. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the intro from Hard Candy, uh, because Harlan always likes to tell us what he's up to, what he's thinking, and that's not just on the micro level, story by story, and indeed he has little, little, uh, like, uh, mini essays before each story. He also does collection by collection, I think, pretty impactful introductions, but they're unusually, as he says repeatedly throughout his career, he likes to walk naked into the world uh, and he craves validation and to like share himself and be approved by the masses. He's like a craven, uh, arrogant narcissist, which adds self admitted that's part of his deal, kind of Eminem esque in that way. And, uh, and so he likes to start his collections by explaining what the collection means to him, sort of what's been going on in his life and why he wrote this set of stories and what themes seem to arise from the set of stories in his mind once he lays them all out before him. And in the intro to Angry Candy, which is called The Wind Took Her Answer Away, um, basically, uh, it's a it's downery. He This is a period where, for some reason, some cosmic twist of fate, I don't think this is necessarily towards the very end of his life, but um, it from 85 to 87, many, many people that were very close to him died in a whole myriad of different ways. And uh, there's this really impactful way. The intro starts where there's a bunch of names listed in the columns and dates, like April 1985, Larry Shaw, May 1985, Ted Sturgeon, and on and on and on. And uh, they read like acknowledgments. Then by the time you get to the third page of them, he explicitly says in the introduction, oh, also in the margins, I'm going to put the names and dates of everyone in the last two years I love who's died. And you go back and go, wow, that is a lot of people. Jesus. So, uh, you know, knock on wood, like I haven't had this period in life, but uh, towards the end of life, you expect that to come at some point. But, um, you know, I it's not uncommon to have a time where you're like, just, oh, this was a brutal year. Like three people close to me died or what have you. And this was that period for Harlan. Um, and he says his main takeaway from this experience is quote, there is no justice inherent in the universe, except what we put there. All the justice that exists is what we put there. Uh, and that's sort of his guiding light for, and he takes that in a good way, right? Like that's not, that's empowering to him. Um, he'd say he guides you through his thoughts around some of the stories and his actual like nitty gritty writing of them um, and says many kind things about his writer friends who passed, uh, including the only thing I really want to note is he does a, a notable section that I think people have commented on before um, where this is basically the origin of the trope that Ellison, who is good friends with L. Ron Hubbard, his defense for the whole Scientology thing, which is not a defense, but he thinks L. Ron Hubbard, he's like, I knew L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, I loved L. Ron Hubbard as a writer and a friend. I get, I, I'm saddened that he invented Scientology. My impression is that it's some kind of get rich quick scheme and he doesn't mean any of it. And he's just very 
smart at thinking a religion will make me very wealthy and powerful. And he wasn't wrong about that. And to Harlan, that's better. That's like a better narrative in his head than that, than that he's uh, cuckoo bananas about the Thetans and whatnot. Um, and I think that's interesting to get into. But uh, I think that may be all I want to say about the intro. Look, I meander, but I say interesting things. They're just pretty disconnected this time. Um, okay, so he wraps up the intro by saying, these are stories I wrote because my friends are gone, a lot of them. And if you can't be angry about it, how the hell much did you care to begin with? Uh, and he describes the title of the collection, Angry Candy, of course, as, right, life is bittersweet. The candy was that we had these times at all. The angry is that they're over and you're gone now. Um, and I find that bittersweet is a great, he's pretty apt at analyzing his own work. Uh, bittersweet is true of almost every story in the collection. And we're starting with the very first cut on the album, The Paladin of the Lost Hour. And to navigate that story with me, returning champion from our uh, last episode where we talked about Deathbird, uh, a grim psychedelic tale of God gone mad <laughs> and, uh, and a dead dog in a dirt grave. My friend Griffin Rowell, I just wanted the dead dog to hang in the air for a second. Hey, Griff, welcome hey, back. Hey, thank you. And for some <laughs> reason, I find uh, I find being with Deathbird uh, kind of more my speed than this one, which is I don't know, maybe it says something about me. Whoa, <laughs> just that's a, a big offer right out of the gate. Well, Interesting. Well, just as a story, I'm not even saying about the the point of it, but the the psychedelic God gone mad is just 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 did it for me. I liked it. Well, that's true. We have, I mean, we've bonded over many, many things because we're best friends since we were like five years old. But one thing we've notably bonded over is like being super high and listening to like Mr. Green Jeans by Frank Zappa. So we like weird stuff is interesting to us. <laughs> if It's weird. I think we share that. Um, psychedelia is cool, man. I'm into it. Uh, not even from a, a drug culture perspective, but I just love weird crap. And I know you yeah. love weird crap. Oh, the weirder, the better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that nails it. If you didn't read along, I highly recommend you do read along. I think it makes the podcast more interesting. The story would take you 20 minutes to read. Oh yeah. Uh, this one's much simpler too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the first thing you should know is if you read Deathbird or just heard our discussion, it's much, much simpler and more straightforward. But let's uh, start with the standard boring question, but it's useful for those people who aren't reading along. Griffin, what was the story about in a nutshell? Yeah. The plot, not the deeper meaning, just what yeah, happened. Sure. Yeah. So a guy's at a cemetery and he sees an old man being attacked by two or three. I can't remember how many exactly, but being attacked some, by some some young ruffians, some punks, and put some punks and saves him, and uh, kind of invites this old man into his life, and they bond. It's pretty. It sounds like pretty briefly, and then uh, it turns out the old man is basically the guardian of the universe, and passes his responsibility on to this. <laughs> Poor stranger who just happens to be a nice guy and uh, and then dies and leaves him alone again in the world. Yeah, pretty much. Although I'd say with the notable, I'm, I know very notable to Harlan uh, point at the end that the nature of the end of the world is an hour. Hence the name the Paladin of the Lost mm -hmm. Hour that has to be guarded on a stopwatch. And uh, the old man sacrifices one minute of that hour so that the young man can resurrect from the dead the spirit of someone whose death in Vietnam he felt responsible for and uh, apologize and be forgiven and absolved of that guilt. Because um, he's like, if you're going to be the new paladin, you have to have that burden removed from your conscience. And he uh, takes the watch, which signifies that he's the new paladin and the old man dies. That's right. The old man dies. Um, so last time we already discussed why I paired this story with you because uh you and i have had lots of conversations about the trajectory of humanity and doomerism and how it f it waxes and wanes but people have always been saying 
oh, you know, enjoy it now because the end is nigh. This generation is the last generation of humanity. And uh, you're a force in my life who's not a doomer. And I find that refreshing. Um, and Deathbird's theme, in some ways, I don't want to misconstrue whatever anyone gets out of it. But I think we at least overlapped on like one of the themes was um, mercy killing is is OK and that the earth might be at that point. Like this might be time to pack it in. This is all fucked. Maybe we should just mercy kill humanity and all walk into the sea or whatever. Very downery, like <laughs> judgment of mankind. Paladin of the Vlo of the Lost Hour, I would characterize as um, dealing with Doomsday because it directly does. But I mean, in an almost hopeful, uplifting way. Griffin, do you agree or disagree? Like, did this feel? How did the? How did the? Like, do you think this author feels the same way about humanity as the Deathbird author? differently let's dive into that um you know i i don't want to just agree with you you know 100 percent. great that would be boring but um mm -hmm. i do think i think i think probably that's mainly true but i do think that there's i think there's a little bit of hopelessness in this one and you know maybe something mm. That isn't binary in the other in Deathbird because we don't know what happens after that universe ends either, right? Do, it, is it actually is it actually the end of everything, or is there some sort of rebirth after that? So I I don't know. I, I think that maybe maybe we can we can assume that with the mercy killing, you know, life goes on the same way that it did after his dog mm. died. But in this one, well, maybe I'm yeah putting too much framework on it because I mean he says in the intro that this is a reaction to all his friends dying. So is this also hopeless? What did you think the takeaway well, was about well, I, I do the think end one, of things? I think we're going to talk a little bit more about it later. But the fact that this paladin has to give away a minute at the end, um, even though it sounds like potentially this has never happened before, means that. There is a, I mean, it's only been 500 years or whatever since they started this whole, this whole responsibility and already we have a minute. So that means, you know, and, and oh, you're doing the years, math on in 30,000 years, of... <laughs> the paladin, you know, potentially will, will, will need to do this a number of times that will mean the end of the universe or whatever, whatever the actual end of this thing is. So. Yeah, I think it's a little hmm. bit hopeless as well. Like it is inevitable that that the end will come at some point. Well, it is inevitable that the end will right. come at some point. Of so, all things, if if not existence itself, or maybe time is an illusion and existence won't, but like certainly humanity will end in the sense that we like, right? Yeah. In the sense that we view time as going forward, humanity has to end. So is it downery to admit that? <laughs> that death exists or will come someday? Well, I guess it depends on who you are. I mean, some yeah. people some people walk around with that uh as a as a common common truth that they know. But a lot of people mm -hmm. don't. Maybe people who read Harlan Ellison do though. So uh maybe in his context is is hopeful. But I still think like if you take a step back, so, yeah. It is it is all going to go at some point. Did you did anything rise in your mind? Because I assume you didn't read the intro because I sent the story to you as an unda yes, like unattached yeah. PDF of the story. Um, when I say that he wrote this, when he says this book is because all my friends died in quick succession um, and it's supposed to be bitter and sweet, you know, loving that they existed, but mourning their passage and allowing myself to be angry. Does that add any dimensionality or direction to the story for you? Um, I mean, I think it, I, I think it, I did think it was hopeful more when I heard, when I read it, but now hearing that, I think mm -hmm. that he probably did think about the hopelessness aspect of it a little bit more. Like, uh, like there is no way to, to escape those feelings. Damn, I fucked it up. I thought I did a downer and an upper. I thought this was the upper. Well, I think it's pretty hopeful. Although, as you say that, I got to admit, um, you know, there's the obvious connection to the Doomsday Clock itself, which, uh, if people aren't aware, is a clock. I think some atomic protest group. Or, oh, you know, it's a group. It's a bogus piece of 
nonsense is what it is. I know. But... You, you can say that. <laughs> or like it's mainly a PR tool in the way that PETA does stuff to try to draw issues to animal rights, but that animal rights are a totally legitimate cause, but it's arguable whether PETA's shit is nonsense or not, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's similar to that. But there's a group that's against nuking people which is good i'm also against that <laughs> for the but record i agree this... i agree with that. yeah 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 <laughs> but they use this clock called the doomsday clock and what's funny is they will i don't know it gets reported on as if they're like the oracle at delphi because um, they'll be like uh so, oh they turn the doomsday clock to 11 58 and give everyone in the world a, i remember growing up when i would hear shit like that like i'd have nightmares for yeah. a week and it's like why are you doing that to people you don't know you don't know um but yeah they count down till the inevitable day that we nuke ourselves <laughs> into oblivion um the doomsday clock and i think he was aware of that and that's obviously yeah not yeah, that resemblance is not unintentional because it's a stopwatch that's ticking down till the end of time. Um, but I, so let's talk about that ending. So, okay, so I'm going to jump way ahead. I will go back to the other questions, but there's a question toward the end of my list that seems like we have to ask now then. Do you think that Gaspar, who's the old man, made the right decision letting Billy have a minute at the end Meaning, so in what I found, and tell me your emotional experience, but I found it very impactful. Uh, I cried when I read this story for the first time. Um, but I love science fiction and I have a prodigious imagination. I tend to be very affected by these things and meet them where they're at. But anyway, um, I cried when he get he finds out, he has this monologue about how this guy that seemingly saved his life in Vietnam and sacrificed his life. And he's had this whole saving private Ryan, like earn this, but he's like a nearly homeless, you know, security guard. Like he feels like his life does not live up to the fact that someone sacrificed their lives for his, he gets to meet that person. And that person is literally like, Oh, I didn't even know you were there. No, no worries. In fact, knowing that my death saved your life, I thought my death was meaningless. Like now I can resolve and go to heaven or whatever happens to spirits. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, that was very cathartic to me. So the question is, do you think he could have been a good paladin? Like, did he need that to be a good paladin of the lost hour? Um, would he have been tortured forever? And cause that's the downside of the system, right? Is the whole reason Gaspar gives the clock away is he's like, it is totally possible to revive dead people with this watch and if you do, the time runs out and there's only an hour left. So like if anyone ever, like if we ever get a shitty paladin, we're doomed, right? Like if they get drunk and use it, that's that. Um, yeah. It can easily be used up. So I don't know. What do you think that it was worth a minute to make him a clean slate again? Like to have his central trauma resolve before yeah. he took the watch. Well, so I actually think this goes back a little bit to what I was saying about the hopelessness of the story, which is this Gaspar guy has been running around for 80 years or 86 years or whatever. And he, you know, he's had the watch for some time and he was only able to, he never actually found anyone. Right. So he, he only gave this watch to Billy because he was about to die. And if that's actually the style of how this works, it's a ter like that's a terrible way <laughs> to do point. things because who do you meet right before you die? He happened to meet a guy who saved his life. Um, you know, it, it sounds like maybe he couldn't die. Right. Like, but he's like, you seem nice. Yeah, I'm going to die. But, I, but I have to die. Yeah. World. So I think because so that that to me means like, so, yes, maybe he made the right decision because Billy was such a broken man that he wouldn't have been able to carry out the responsibility without it. But it also makes me think like, oh, yeah, this is this is doom because the actual mechanism of keeping the world alive revolves around chance and luck and it will and you know, human failings and human failings but right? so isn't that true like isn't that true of potentially nuking ourselves or letting a pandemic get out of control and 
for political reasons, no one will do anything to stop it. Like human failings are part of the system of events that could lead to our downfall. Right. And so, but, but if you, but if you bring it back to the death bird, then maybe they're not, maybe that's just a continuum of the same story because what he's saying here is if we rely on human, on human failings as our solution to our problems, then at some point, our luck will run out because human failings will not be able to live up to those. That's interesting because now, fuck, I didn't do this on purpose, but now it seems the opposite because now when I look back at Deathbird, I'm like, well, Deathbird, it was God's fault. Yeah. He was saying, God, you have God actually, that's the twist of Deathbird or whatever the offer is. What if God was one of us a stranger on the bus no what if god actually was working against us like what if god is an asshole um that kind of even though it would make life hell and he's saying yeah and life kind of is hell get it uh, i'm being deep um but uh it it also lets you off the hook right <laughs> or yeah. if humanity ends it's an act of bravery for us to end it to wrest it away from an insane god and then in paladin it's like uh, if the world ends it's because oh we were tempted we couldn't couldn't stay pure huh maybe this one's a downer i don't know <laughs> but i guess i i was happier when it and deathbird makes me feel weirder <laughs> Um, do you think Billy made the right decision denying the old man? Because then that's what's interesting as the final moment is he says, now, before I die, please, can I see my dead wife? Um, yeah. Just uh, to be to, and then I'll die. And he says, no, even okay. though you just gave me a minute. I think that's such a cool maneuver uh, on Harlan's part. But like, what do you read of, out of that? Of course he made the right decision. <laughs> The whole, oh, okay. The whole because you can't just go stability. give away minutes willy nilly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then if he did that, that would mean mm -hmm. that he would expect the same from the next paladin, and then that would be the breakdown of the entire system, right? Within a number, within a yeah, so hundred years or so. So if you're using two minutes every lifetime, and let's say they get a fifty-year tenure, and there's an hour left. So 30 times 50. So yeah, so, yeah we'll 3, get like, like 3,500 years before we all yeah. die. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Jumping back to the original flow. So let's talk about the textural. Uh, I know we both are interested in the band Ween, for example. And I bring that up because <laughs> of their extreme range. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm saying so like, Compare that vis-a-vis. -vis. <laughs> yeah, I think you see where I'm going. I see, um, I see. The dis differences between Deathbird and this story, is that impressive to you, that range? Is that, uh, was that bewildering? Well, uh, no, it's not bewildering. Do you like one style more than the other? Oh, Let's I, talk about that. Well, I love the other style more. The you other style the was like a crazy Cormac shit, yeah. McCarthy, like, mind-bending. Just even reading it was mind-bending, right? Mm -hmm. Um yeah. And I think it I, I honestly think it's way more impressive of a piece of writing than this, which is very straightforward and has very typical prose, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think it also, you know, it's kind of like a Picasso, right? You have to you have to be a master of of the of the typical in order to mm -hmm. to really flex those kinds of muscles. Start breaking so, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think the other one was was more impressive, but uh, but this was like this was competent, competently written. It made sense and everything. Um, but yeah, that's how that's yeah. how I feel about the two. I don't know. What about you? Um, I mentioned Ween because I am impressed by the range. Obviously, he's my favorite writer, so I like all the things that he does. Uh, but uh, and I think there's. Yeah, I think I agree. Like Deathbird also brought me to tears with the dead dog bit. Yeah. And yeah. uh and that is more impressive because it's not moored to any traditional 
I think this is very, for a traditional, straightforward, rooted story, I still think he does it correctly. Meaning, like, the arc builds, you get a reveal at the end that puts it all in a new context, there's emotional catharsis, there's an interesting twist that makes you think. Um, So it's all correct. That's why I love all of Harlan Ellison. But yeah, I definitely, if I had to keep one, I would keep the crazy death (laughs) bird end of, just like I would keep, you know, Sgt. Pepper's over rubber soul if you are an old person and that scans for you um uh yeah because yeah i'm I, i like i mean but you know what this is an interesting conversation actually i'm kind of also sick of it or I feel like um, I'm always interested in where an art movement goes by the end of the exploration, right? Because I want the more complicated, finalized version of where is this exploration leading. But there's also something to be said for everything is that now and everything is meta and so postmodern and deconstructed. There's something refreshing about straightforward stories that stay in scope, you know, <laughs> that aren't trying to be everything. Um, well, I think that I just... I don't think that we can actually exist as as an identity if we're always being bent like that and and stretched. So I think you have to have both. I mean, you could argue that conservatives stories, conservatives and progressive progressives politically have to exist together or else either side goes too far and and then everything's out of whack. So I think that's just two sides of humanity that we have to deal with. (laughs) That's why Elon bought Twitter. It's to bring the balance back. Uh huh. Yeah. Let's please you have both sides. Please, I can't handle anymore. Elon Musk <laughs> right, we won't right talk now. about that. We won't talk about that. Uh, yeah, it's annoying. People are probably like, I hate hearing his name all the time lately. Yeah. Let's just stop talking about him. Um, in that case, I want to bring something up about the fact that it is straightforward. So. Harlan also found success in Hollywood, California, where dreams are built. Uh, At least the dream that I am driving my life into the ground to try and achieve. Uh, He he found a lot of success getting his stuff adapted more than you might think. So um, very famously, he did some original series, Star Trek episodes that are very highly regarded that we will be covering on this show someday. Uh, City on the Edge of Forever, something like that. I actually haven't seen it, uh, which I know will make some people listening to this freak out, but I'm not an original series guy. You're, but, you're uh, a TNG man all the way through. I am a TNG and beyond. TNG DS9 Voyager for the win. But regardless, uh, this, you cannot adapt. You could. I mean, someone could nowadays, but it would be much harder to adapt Deathbird, right? It would be like Terrence Malicky, and I don't know that it would even work. Like, it feels like the written version would work much better than any kind of direct adaptation. Whereas, I think he started writing stories like this because they could get adapted. He could sell them to, you know, they could get made into TV shows. And this indeed was made into a Twilight Zone episode. Not the good old black and white Rod Serling Twilight Zone. Not the new good Jordan Peele Twilight Zone. Uh, a color Twilight Zone reboot in the 80s that <laughs> was widely regarded as underwhelming. Um, and I bring it up because just whenever there is an adaptation, I want to mention it. Um, I tried to send Griffin the link to watch it, but I don't think it worked out. So I'm just going to quickly riffle off my insights. If you are interested, the entire episode Paladin of the Lost Hour Twilight Zone segment is available on YouTube. It's like 35 minutes. It stars Danny Kay, a minor member of the Rat Pack, and uh, also uh, Glenn. I don't want to get Is it Truman? Terman? Dang it. I should have looked this up, which I will now. Terman. Yeah, that's right. Well, I know him as Mayor Royce from The Wire. Um, Glenn Turman as Billy Canetta and Danny Kay as Gaspar, directed by Alan Smithy, which if you don't know, when a, something comes out so poorly that the director takes their name off it, uh, the whatever registry of directors has dictated for whatever reason that the na- the fake name that goes in is Alan Smithy. So this is a segment so bad the director didn't want to be associated with it. Um, and I think it largely boils down to Danny Kaye's performance, which Harlan has said, and I agree. It's fascinating how he doesn't do anything wrong. But speaking of TNG, I love TNG, but it is like a stage play. You know, there's a unique style of acting that's not what we would call modern, natural acting. And Danny Kaye's of that era and does that. 
And I, uh, I really think this should be a very intimate sort of mumblecore story, you know, um, to do it very arch and very, as if you're on a stage doing the lines, uh, just sort of undermines it. And I think it's an interesting exercise in how, damn, now I sound hella old, like so old, but here I'm going to say what I'm about to say. The magic of books, children, <laughs> like the, I think every <laughs> medium, you know what? I'll sound now I'll sound new and fresh and young, um, like stream, you know, video games have this as well. Every medium has an inherent level you meet it at and different sort of relationship and thing you get out of it. And I think what's unique about scanning your eyes across symbols and translating them into full images and concepts in your brain is you have so little to work with, right? You're really just looking at black ink on a page, like symbols, like random. They're not even pictures of what you're trying to imagine. They're just symbols. Um, so you're like a computer, like you are encoding this shit into. So it requires so much effort that I find you get out what you put in with reading. And if you read hard and I read hard, like uh, it's highly, highly rewarding. I think people who like to play Dungeons and Dragons or things that are very imagination driven probably get a lot out of reading specifically um, and watching the Paladin of the Lost Hour on TV, it kind of somehow diminishes it and put it puts it in a tiny little box where you're like, oh, okay, right. It's just a real old man. I forgot. I'm just looking at an old man. Um, and it, it really, uh, I love TV and there's so many things that can only work on TV. Uh, but I think it's a great example of how, yeah, the book was better because of the imagination thing that's there. And when you just see a guy in a cemetery and some classic like late 80s, early 90s street punks beating him up, you're like, this is kind of cheesy. Um, yeah, that's that. We're done talking about the show that Griffin didn't watch. You can wake up well, again. Well, we can, we can uh, kind of go into one of the other questions with it, which is there's one glaring problem with it being adapted or that's what I was going to, yeah, visual go for medium, it. <laughs> which is in the book or in the story, it says one was black, one was white about Billy and Gaspar. Um, but it doesn't say which one very purposely, mm-hmm. uh, purposefully, obviously. And it just ruins the entire, it ruins the entire thing by having a character depicted as one or the other. So, it seems like, why did Harlan Ellison even let this be adapted? Not only did he let it be adapted, he wrote the script and he reads oh, he the did. narration. He does the Rod Serling part at the end. Oh. Like, it's his voice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he liked to be heavily involved in his, and in uh, in additional materials, he talks about, like, yeah, that one didn't come out. It wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> and he also blames so Danny So when you read this... When you read this, I don't, I don't know if your mind did it, but which one yeah. which one did you want to be black and which one did you want to be white? Or which one did you think oh, yeah. was one or the other? Well, so first off, I want to say I that's what also I think makes him the best is like even in a straightforward short like this, this is an especially short story, very grounded. He's still deploying tactics where it's just like, that's interesting. I've never seen a writer do that before. And you could only do it in writing uh, to move it to Mm -hmm. any other medium kills it. So I'm like, I don't know. He's just he's still great, even when he's being humble. Uh, But what I did is because I play lots of video games with multiple outcomes and this is the same thing I do. You just save your game and try all the outcomes, right? So I sat and imagined if it was one way and what did that mean? And I sat and imagined if it was the other way and what did that mean? And then I sat and imagined like, well, what if that wasn't in the story and they were just both the same race? What does that mean? And then I tried to triangulate. What do I think Harlan meant by that? Because weirdly, and this is not what's important about art, so don't do like I do, kids. But what I'm always obsessed with is I want to know, am I reading it right am i getting out and that's like paintings and everything i'm like the ultimate goal for me is to know what the artist meant to say and agree with them <laughs> i always just want to really I always want to know well what did they mean yeah yeah i but think because i'm very validation driven but what if their insights are less meaningful than what you would have derived yourself that's what i'm saying i probably do myself and art a disservice but when I watch films, 
my I realize my ulterior goal is usually to try and decode what is Werner Herzog thinking at this moment? Why? Did oh, well, he that's do not that? fair. That's because it's Werner uh, Herzog director, asking you I'm to do that. I'm saying any director. <laughs> But but you know what I mean? Whereas what I should really be asking is, what do I think about this? What do I get out of this arrangement of things? But for some reason, I think because of school, um, I, yeah, it's very drilled into me to be like, did I get it right, though? Like, what was the real answer? Like, you could tell me, mm-hmm. Werner Herzog, what did you mean? Did I get it right? Was my guess accurate? And uh, that actually doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, but. And, um, and Werner Herzog would would tell you that to your face, too. That's he would say you have failed by investigating it at all. (laughs) But uh, in this case, what I got from it was that I think he's especially because of the era and the fact that Billy is a Vietnam vet, I think. And uh, I think he wanted to. You know, bring obviously like racial discord was highlighted by Vietnam. And he wanted to say like, and they, I'm, I wonder if there's more to it, but all I got from it really was like, and they overcame this hurdle as well. Like this could have been a problem, but isn't. And it instantly makes you be like, okay, so both of these guys are chill at an acceptable level right away. Right. Because <laughs> it's unfortunately true, uh, especially 50 years ago, but still now, right. It's unfortunately true that like if an old, either way, if an old black man meets a young white man or vice versa in a cemetery in an inclement situation and they immediately like shake hands and are like, are you OK? Oh, yeah. Are you OK? You're like, oh, good. <laughs> or like, that's a good that's a good indicator that neither of them are pieces of shit. Like, it's sad that that litmus test is required, but it's there. Um, so I think he's pulling out race to say, like, uh, race isn't an issue here f- between these two men, which is an important and worthwhile thing to note. Uh, yeah. And it also, I don't know if, you know, obviously I don't know if he intended this, but by, by explicitly saying that there is a difference there and that it's a difference mm-hmm. that's been so problematic for our country's history, especially um, mm-hmm. it gives a lot of, I think it gives a lot of voice to different different perspectives too right so if you're forced to say like as a white man i don't read this and go oh it's two white dudes and then that's that's what's yeah that's what's keeping the world alive it's, it's saying you know humanity as a whole has to work towards this that's true and i do like that if you flip it either way you kind of get a different take so like if gaspar's white then you're just kind of relieved that the old, old man is not racist, is what I'm saying. Yeah, Billy, like it speaks in his favor. Billy and then, was white in my head, for sure, because I, mm. I, yeah, I just, because of the act of grace, I think that was the more, it, it was the way that you would see 50 years ago that someone would be worthy of carrying a burden, right? Like if Harlan Ellison was yeah. trying to express that. And they went the other way, and it's just because, I mean, in the you know TV series, and it's just because they landed Danny Kay and he was a big name, which yeah. is so fascinating to me because it's like giving away. You're like, no, that was too important a decision to leave up to. Well, we got Danny Kay, let's just use him. Although Glenn Turman is awesome and has always been awesome, so he does a great job. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what? So, so in your head, you said you examined both ways because I was much more. It was just intuitive yeah. that I was like. I want the old man to be a, to be an old black man who's gone through all this mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, when you when you thought about it, uh, what what did you get from? Was it, is that really what you got? Is that oh, if if, if the younger guy is the black well, guy, then it shows the old man's chill. I go the other way because yeah, I think it's more relieving to me for Gaspar to not be racist than that. Okay, here's my issue with. And it's, but it's fat. This is why I'm glad he threw it, threw it in. Cause it's fascinating to force yourself to think about it both ways. Um, if Gaspar is an old black man, then he, then Billy is a white, a young white man in a position of privilege in the country he exists with, you know, in the system he's in and who gets the minute and gets his catharsis resolved. And the old, black man 
has to be told, no, you can't see your dead wife and just die. <laughs> like, oh. I think it actually becomes a statement on uh, systemic, like, intersectional racist issues <laughs> if it's that way. And then the other way, it's just like, oh, thank God, Gaspar's not a piece of shit. Um, well, so it's, like, simpler that way and then but more complicated both, the other way. But they're both heroes, and it was a test. Gaspar didn't want They're both good, and they both want good things, and they agree. Well, yeah, then, yeah. well you could also spin it that you could say it's a it's a statement on systemic racism, but you could also say that an old black man bestowing this gift to a young white man uh, shows the power shows the power of a non-white person too. So I I don't you know we could oh we yeah could. to trust a, a mem- like to see him as more than just an emblem of the oppressor race yeah like that shows yeah yeah well, elevation I mean, of the human spirit as well and like you said no matter which way you slice it. The main takeaway is that it takes all of humanity banning together. Right, right, right. Yeah. But as a so human, right, that it's important that he wasn't like, this is two Korean gentlemen. Like, it has to be two different races. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that he just throws that in like nothing. And it's such yep. an interesting just tactic the, you can talk about for like a good 10 minutes. Just a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> If you could take a minute off the stopwatch and you had to use it, don't worry about the end of humanity. It's more like a what superpower would you have question. Um, who, what would you do? Would you bring back a loved one you know? You know what I mean? You, but you could, so the rule is that the stopwatch can resurrect dead people's spirits to speak with you for some amount of time. Would you bring back Abe Lincoln? Like, what are you doing with that minute, dude? Man, this is actually... It's a hard really, question, right? It's a it's a really good question, and actually one that like makes me feel bad about myself because I t- I don't <laughs> have like a burning desire to bring back someone for one, one minute oh. like, at all. I don't even know what you would accomplish. Jesus, in one minute. I mean, no, uh, that would not be my my first. This guess. makes me wish more people I loved were dead. Like, I mean, I like Just if kidding, I'm gonna bring God, back, a, don't jinx me. I, no, yeah. <laughs> If I was going to bring back someone wise, I'd probably go with Buddha or something like God. But um, yeah. Yeah. You're like whoever Buddha really was or was based on Siddhartha or whoever, like that human. Yeah. Yeah. Present them to me. I have some questions. But also, what are you going to do in a minute? I just don't even know. Like literally, he had to have. No, that's what's funny because if someone's famous, then their school of thought has been crystallized. If you know what I mean. So like. If you asked Buddha, I don't think you'd have to be like, where am I? You're Buddha. You, like, you wouldn't have to explain. That's not part of the hypothetical, right? Okay. Buddha yeah, yeah. would know what's going on with the watch. But still, <laughs> what's Buddha going to say in 60 seconds? Even if you said, like, Buddha, tell me the most important things about life. I'm sure that they would say roughly the stuff you know that they would say. That's why their wisdom's so famous, because it's valuable and it's been better, right? Like, they would say, like, be present. Um, don't be bound by desire. And you'd be like, I know this already. Tell me the secret shit. And he'd be like, there isn't that. I told you everything. That's why there's Buddhism. <laughs> like, I don't know. What are you going to ask that hasn't been asked of some of these figures? Yeah. I. Th- that's why I would be very interested in, I think I would bring back, so it's hard to elucidate, but like a representative nobody, like a schlub from some interesting time period. Like, I would ask the watch to pick someone at random from, like, the era of Nantucket whaling or something. Because I just think it would be interesting, or even older than that. Because I guess what I'm always interested in is there's this idea that even ancient man, right? Humanity has been around such a relatively short time that ancient is a relative term, right? So, like... Ancient man's brain and and literal physical structures of their brain were a lot more similar to ours than you'd think. We think of cavemen as like, oh, they must have been stupid, like had less memory capacity, like a less good computer. No, you're just supported. You're standing on the shoulders of thousands of generations of figuring out how shit works, right? If you were left in the woods with no language at, from scratch, you wouldn't invent very many things by the time you died either it would be a miracle that you fed your kids and got the next generation off the ground like inventions build upon themselves and that's how we have society so there's this idea that cavemen thought a lot more like us than you'd imagine but then there's also the thought of like 
Yeah, but we have a specific clock in our heads based on a shared understanding of time based on a calendar, and all these things are made up. We think about money, which is made up. That makes us think of life in a certain transactional way. So I would want to ask someone from very ancient times, like, I don't know, I'd probably do ancient Egypt. So I'd be like, give me some schlub, farmer from the Nile. And I just want to ask questions like, do you worry about what's going to happen next Tuesday? Does that does your mind race with a to-do list of thoughts? I want to know what other people's mental space was like from other eras. Well, of time. why not just say the first Homo sapien then? Because I guess then I so this is a stupid question because then I do have a technical question like could we communicate? Yeah, you'd have to be do able to communicate. We speak the same language, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Shit, I can't speak Egyptian, though. All right, you're right. A minute is useless. It's nothing. It's, uh, yeah, it's actually... I, maybe maybe that's why it hasn't been So used. that's the heart of the question is, who could you have a substantive transaction with in a minute? Because this guy is set up for it because he has a guy who jumped in front of a bullet for him who he never met. He, that's like a perfect situation to be like, hey, what was that about? You have a minute to answer me. <laughs> well, I think hmm. it might actually speak to the fact that Maybe we just don't have the trauma necessary for this because like I like my mom, for instance, would probably want her dad back for a minute. He died when she was six. So right. she I think there could be some healing like in the story. But again, but for what me, would you I'm say, like, I love you. What would yeah, he say? I love just, you. They already hug. know that. <laughs> I know. I know. But I but I can I can imagine it would be. Cathartic. No, I know it's yeah. worth it for the for the experience, obviously. Right. Uh. But I don't know informationally. I guess, yeah, I guess I'll leave the question at that because I don't have anything that I could resolve in one minute. Even in an hour, like, it actually is a pretty worthless amount of time to worry about using up. Because it's like, okay, well, I know this is the end of the world, so I don't know, an hour, what am I going to do with that? Bring back Steve Jobs and be like, what were you going to invent next? And no, then invent he didn't that. invent anything. What are you talking about? I know, about? that's what I'm saying. Is there's no one. All right. Uh, but you could do like, I don't know, Tesla, Edison. Uh, Edison also kind of just amalgamated other people's inventions. And Tesla's uh, probably just too, too, much too weird to do much with in an hour. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Tesla would be interesting to talk to for an hour, though, I will say Probably, that. that's probably true. Um, okay, well, I think the race thing and the whole story and the fact that the fate of the humanity doesn't come down to geopolitics, but is instead is just whether someone does this watch or not. Uh, and the frailty of humanity is so much on trial here. I think that all speaks to the idea of social interdependence and, and that being hopeful for humanity's future. So that's why I thought this was hopeful ultimately is that it is the story of strangers two human beings meeting as strangers immediately uh, taking it on good faith that they don't intend each other harm, like verifying trust, becoming friends, and then sharing the responsibility for humanity's future. So it's kind of uh, Deadwoodish in that it's like the story of the formation of, right, two things that were separate, forming a connection and a mutual understanding, building towards something broader. Like, is this not the very building block of what society is, of what humanity is? Is yeah. like two strangers becoming not strangers. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll agree with that. I think that's that hopeful. I, I, hey, I was coming up with a reason to disagree with you on the hopelessness thing. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I that, appreciate your dedication to making the podcast interesting. Yeah, um, I, but I do. Yeah, I mean, this is how we are talking to each other across space is this collaboration between people. Um, it's the only way. It's the only way that we have accomplished what we've accomplished. Um, but it's just that there is a flip side, right? Like it, this, it's kind of a neutral. It's it's neutral because that collaboration can be equally as destructive as it is constructive. And it's much easier to destroy yeah. than to build. So, I mean, that kind of goes back to the to the chance of it is that it's not one way or the other is not really. Uh, it's not a sure outcome. So. Right. Well, yeah. And he also said the story is about taking responsibility. But I got to say, if I am putting on my like cracked analytical hat, uh, if 
if I had this watch, I wouldn't keep it a secret and make it just me, this one guy, I am responsible for this. I would uh, present it to society and share it with all of humanity and there'd be a special glass case that that watch is in that is guarded with lasers and shit. You know what I mean? There's oh, well, better no ways one can touch go it. about this. It's yeah, magical. exactly. Right. So, so here's or my actual would, thing. Uh, bury it in cement and be like, now humanity can never die because the watch is inaccessible. <laughs> Good job. And, and also to me, one thing that's just a little bit strange is that the burden of the watch is actually not that heavy. Like it's a watch that no one can touch, right? The punks try to grab mm -hmm. it and it floats into the air and they can't. They can't grab oh, it. right. It avoids everyone except it instinctively only wants to be held by the paladin. Yeah. And it's and it says Gaspar didn't accomplish very much in life, but it doesn't say that it's because of the watch or anything. So it really seems like you just have this watch and then you got to find someone else to pass it on to before you die. Yeah, that's right. It's just that Pulp Fiction scene. That's all. Yeah. Which is Hey. Maybe Butch was a pallet in the Lost Hour. That's why he needed his daddy's watch. Maybe. It totally works, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but th I, th that was a little bit weird to me in the story. It's like, why is this watch? It seems so easy to have this watch. Is he saying? Is how the hell is insane? Well, but the that... temptation, it's just a constant battle with temptation with yourself because you can use it. And that's bad, right? That's so, really, issue. he shouldn't be looking for someone who's good. You should be looking for a nihilist who doesn't see value in the time that is left. But if it was a true nihilist, they might just let the clock run out on a whim one day for no reason. Well, then don't find a true nihilist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Find, just find a goth. Give it to a goth. Although I guess, uh, I guess if you if people will have trauma and you can't, you can't determine what loss someone will have. So you have to find someone who will just absolutely not take advantage of it. It's just that. Yeah. I think the goal is just to find someone who appreciates the value of human life. Right. And he felt that Billy had that. Yeah. 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 Someone who will be a stalwart defender. All right. I'll go. I'll uh, go. With but, that. but you're right. There's no way we'd make it 3,500 years. Like, by the way, I don't even think that's right. <laughs> anyway, I'm bad at fast math when I'm recording. I'm not uh, that good either. Fifty, one or no way. What do we say? Fifty times thirty. Whatever. My point is, it would have. I don't know. You're right. Now I'm bummed out. Like, you'd get seven paladins through the chain, and then one of them would get drunk and want to talk to their dead dad, and that would be that. <laughs> like, I don't. I think it wouldn't work for too long. <laughs> this system um it's a bad system for sure it's a bad it's a bad system the pope that apparently the pope started i don't know yeah. there's a funny uh, you know there's also, like science gobbledygook explanation in the story I'm, i actually don't understand i i, I mean I'm, maybe i'm too dense like i don't understand what the pope did he he erased he erased what, I, don't, I think it's supposed to be poetic more than it makes I, sense in a sci-fi way but uh in the story the idea is which is true in some sense, we reconciled the calendars, right? And that's part of daylight savings times or some shit. We reconciled the calendars at one point and we had to shorten the year by an hour because because we realized that our timing was off. And then we got the modern calendar that we use today. It was just like some time that the Pope had to oversee uh, a redoing of the global calendar and shifted it by an hour. And the idea is that somehow that hour was the hour that the the secret is the Da Vinci code is that that hour was actually the hour that the world was going to end. And the Pope did this to avert that. And that hour is on this watch. <laughs> it's not fully explained, but like that hour is what's unfolding on the watch. If that, you let it go, then that actually just made me realize it's funny that we just had this conversation about race and everything. But mm -hmm. the fact that the Pope was able to make this determination for the entirety of humanity <laughs> and Pope, save yeah. humanity is like way worse than any of the, <laughs> any of the and that the system the pope devised the system presumably or the pope is like and we shall have it a watch and we shall <laughs> pass yeah. the watch down and like that's a bad system pope you're dumb bad pope uh speaking of dumb and bad i never want to go easy on anyone so i will mention that uh right after the line which we just said is so fraught with interesting 
meaning to unpack. One of these men was black. The other was white. Two sentences later, you get, and then the men were absorbed by grave matters, by matters of graves. Not good. That's bad. It's bad. Line. <laughs> but no. that brings us to Harlan's parlance. <laughs> The segment where we say any lines that stood out to us from the story that we want to mention word for word. It, it's a lot more straightforward than Death Birds, so I don't... Do you have any? No, not it's really, do you? straightforward. Um, who would have thought the old man to have had so much battle in him, I think, is a misguided uh, Macbeth reference? Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? But... I don't know. I thought worth mentioning for Shakespeare nerds. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I highlighted. Oh, I like I like the effect of uh, Billy's apartment was charisma poor. It was a place to come when all other possibilities had been expended. I like that. Yeah. I like. Uh, That's bleak. <laughs> I really love. This is the kind of Harlan stuff that he does frequently that I still very much like because. I have a perverse need to like prove my writing teachers wrong, who always talked about being like Hemingway and being concise. Uh, he said, the old man walked carefully to the most comfortable chair in the room, an overstuffed 30s style lounger that had been reupholstered many times before Billy Canetta purchased it at the American Cancer Society thrift shop. So the comedy writer in me loves, I love when you get specific. <laughs> I think it's very evocative and a good technique. Um, they started to cross the avenue. Now nah, that's just the same technique again. He does that technique a lot. It's not like unique to this story. I was visiting the grave of a man who was in my rifle company in Vietnam. No, I just highlighted that so I could remember the plot. You know what I'm realizing? I should do two colors. One color that's stuff that I'm just highlighting for my own purposes and one color <laughs> that's the stuff I'm going to read. I don't want Frankenstein's and I'm going back to bed. Boom, boom, boom. It's all normal. It's all normal, guys. This is one he just wrote normal. Okay, then I guess all I'll mention is the thing at the end, which I do think is pretty important. Um, you've got to heal, Billy. Yeah, okay. There, the very end of the story. There in the place where all lost things returned, the young man sat on the cold ground, rocking the body of his friend, and he was in no hurry to leave. There was time. And then there's a epitaph at the end. A blessing of the 18th Egyptian dynasty. God be between you and harm in all the empty places you walk. And I just think, what I love about that is I don't even, I can't fully elucidate the resonance between that thought and the feeling I have at the end of the story, but it's, it, but there's something there. Like, I think almost like Lynch is good at putting elements together that defy full. Like, I, I don't know what Harlan means by putting that at the end exactly, but I know that it makes me feel something. And to me, that's like a magic trick. Yeah. What do you think about the little thing at the end? It's also the VO that he reads in the twilight zone. Oh, really? He says yeah. it out loud. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I, don't have much to add to it, but I felt the same way too. I was like, huh, what is, what is this? But I didn't. It's a little poetic touch decide. and I don't know what it means, but I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. like it. Yeah. <laughs> or does it imply that this system dates back to Egypt? Like, I don't know. I know. It's right. just evocative. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's a nice, I looked it up and that's real. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of, that's a nice blessing. I like that. God be between you and in all the empty places you walk. Very evocative. Good job, Harlan Ellison. All right. Well, good job, uh, ancient almost, Egypt, I guess. Good job, ancient <laughs> Egypt. Um, uh, yeah, that reminds me of a very interesting story Alex Schmitz told on Vana Guys, which is our previous podcast about the works of Kurt Vonnegut. You can find anywhere you find podcasts if you want to hear the story in its entirety about uh, these places that used to exist where, you know, before the internet, Writers could call all these people who were just at phone banks and have them look shit up. And they had like every reference book in the world at their disposal. So you'd call and be like, I'm writing a book. There's a character in Botswana. Like, what do they say in Botswana when they get up in the morning? Like, what's their good morning culturally? And uh, it would be like a 900 number. You'd pay them by the minute. And they'd look it up and find that information for you. Uh, I just think that's so fascinating that all these guys work that way. Like, I bet Harlan had to call someone and figure out this Egyptian dynasty thing. What an age we live in. <laughs> what an age we live in, man. <laughs> Do you remember when I got in trouble for calling a 1-900 number to hear a pre-recorded tape tell us how to beat the Willie Beamish video game? 
I yeah. Well, we got in trouble. I got to talk to you about yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it was a, like a hundred bucks back in the yeah early nineties. I'm sure younger people are not aware because there's no reason to be, but you could call an automated voice line for yeah. you know, it was like the money Sega minute. hotline <laughs> for game facts for like walkthroughs. So it would go like, are you at the forest kingdom? <laughs> Press one. And you'd go through the whole game that way. It would take like 25 minutes if you were towards the end of the game. And it would really get to like a recorded voice telling you, like in the case of this game, Willie Beamish, like you need to put the frog on the skateboard and shove the skateboard down the ramp. Thank you. And then it hangs up and they charge you $55. Uh, but you could progress in the game. That's all that mattered. <laughs> and, <laughs> all right. Um, and it was apparently yeah. a super predatory practice because who else would be yeah. calling it except for some kids who don't understand money? <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, yeah, we didn't understand what we were doing. Um, okay. Our final segment now uh, is an increasingly great regret of my life <laughs> which is we do three jokes so that there are at least six jokes in the universe about every harlan ellison short story which is something that i truly believe wouldn't exist otherwise so here's three six one-liner jokes about paladin of the lost hour griffin you start oh really this is also a great regret of my life by the way so <laughs> um so it's typical of a Catholic pope to discover discover something in poisoning the flock and passing the problem on to the next guy. I don't know if it's a joke quite as much as an it's observation. a funny observation. I, it hasn't been honed. I'm into not a, a comedy yet. writer. You can't. Yeah, I don't even know how to write a point. joke. Um, I am a comedy writer, so I have no excuse about how bad these are. Well, this now, thing, Billy Canetta. You are Paladin of the Lost Hour. This means you safeguard creation and also all undead within 30 feet have to make a wisdom saving throw or be turned. Dungeons good, and Dragons good Dungeons joke. and Dragons joke. <laughs> um, uh, this one barely makes any sense. I'm sorry. <laughs> Two guys walk into a cemetery and one says to the other, can you spare a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior? Sorry. Yeah, to talk to our Lord. That joke's amazing if you just change one word. Can you spare a minute to talk to our Lord and Savior? Get it? Because you yeah. can bring him back. Okay. Hey. That's fucking funny. All That's right. Good. That, good. You just needed a punch up. Um, <laughs> God, this one's so bad. What was I thinking? They should update this pocket watch, man. It's been like 600 years. Can I get this as a calendar alert? Can we put this in the cloud? Feels like this could have been an email. 1001, 59 mins till universe ends. Is that so hard to type out? I don't know who this character is that I'm being, but <laughs> <laughs> they're it's, annoyed about the pocket watch system. <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, Andy Rooney. Or a reverse yeah. Andy Rooney? I don't know. Reverse, because he's like, can we keep updating things until they're as modern as possible? That dude, if I was still a cracked, I would pitch that next week. <laughs> uh, uh, a really, like, will you cast an 11 year old kid to, to be, be Andy, Andy Rooney? Rooney? But he's like nostalgic about lasers and flying cars. <laughs> like, <laughs> when are we going to have laser powered jetpacks, you know? <laughs> All right. You, then on. you have to hire an 11 year old. Anywho, okay. Even a yeah. broken watch is right twice a day, but my doomsday cult keeps moving the goalpost. <laughs> Excellent. And I, so I'm i looking at my notes. I have four this time. So here comes two in a row. Oh, it's because one of them, I'm like, only four people will get this, but they'll really like it. So I may as well write a fourth. But here's the third one. Wait a minute. A magic pocket watch that resurrects the dead? More like Obradin of the Lost Hour. Am I right? I don't get that. Again, what is four it? or five people will get that. Uh, there's a great game called Return of the Obra Dinn, <laughs> where that's based around having a magic pocket watch that resurrects the dead. Oh, wow. wow. Um, and then my joke, my big four quadrant joke that's going to be a hit in China is the dude I really need to talk to is the paladin of the lost car keys. You seen him? Yeah, it's classic. People misplaced it. <laughs> but like, that's more of a Pixar movie joke, you know, that could play... Yeah. To a why a broad swath of humanity. Yeah, I mean, it sounded oh, like Andrew boy. Dice Clay when, yeah. you, when you read it. Hey, he was popular. He was. He was. Um, <laughs> all right. I think that's it. I think we're at time. 
thank you, Griffin, for yeah. doing double double duty, discussing two Ellisons in a row. Well, it's always nice to talk to you. Yeah, I have. I Any actually excuse. don't even know if these come out. As far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, someone, if you're listening to this, hit Griffin up on Twitter. He's at Griffasaurus. I don't. And just use. say, <laughs> I exist. I listened to the thing. I heard it. Oh. Did oh, you, you don't go on Twitter anymore? Well, I mean, I do. I only did for a short time. Yeah, I, I just don't like social media. Can't do it. But Trump is back on, dude. We can continuously dunk on him, thereby amplifying and normalizing his messages. How does the second most annoying person in the world have control yeah. over my access to the first per- most annoying person in the world. <laughs> yeah. I also love that uh, they have a pain called now we got to go because when you're talking about the Elon Twitter thing, it's fucking time is up. But uh, the you might like pain and who you should follow. It's just continuously who you should follow. Elon Musk. You might like Donald Trump. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> no, I might not. <laughs> That's a no and a no. Um, and they just sit there like the algorithm has been co-opted oh, yeah. by yeah. a guy like three kids in a long trench coat being like just, you know, handing out stickers. Anyway, uh, thank you much for listening all. We hope you got something out of reading both Deathbird and Paladin of the Lost Hour. If you're following along, I will tweet this information as well when this episode drops. But... Uh, I know it already, so I'm just going to say it right now with my mouth. Our next episode will be on Repent Harlequin Said the TikTok Man with the original Vana friend himself, Alex Schmidt. Um, Yes, my co-host, I mean, I'd call him the host and me his co-host, from back in uh, Vana Guy's days. Alex will come by and bless us and deign the podcast as uh, genuine and authentic and what's the word I'm thinking of? Worthwhile? We'll have value. We'll finally have value because Alex says so. So look out for that. Read Repent Harlequin said the TikTok man. And we'll see you next time. This has been a small beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The beans always have new ideas percolating. So make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash small beans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash small beans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you.